Well, g'day and welcome to the channel. In today's video, I'm reviewing the Sony A6700 for wildlife photography. I'm gonna be using both the Sony 200-600 and the Tamron 150-500. I wanna answer all the questions you might have about the autofocus, the FPS, the value, the overall performance. Can this camera work for wildlife photography and what are the types of photos we're gonna get? So I'll share lots of photos and I'll give you my honest opinion about what I think about this camera. Now for full disclosure, I did get sent this body by Sony and this lens by Tamron. They've not paid me any money and they don't have any input over what I say. All right, let's talk about the body itself. And the first and most obvious thing is the size. It's absolutely tiny. I've never used a 6000 series body before, so I was kind of shocked at how small it is. How does it fit in my hands? I don't have big hands, but my pinky finger struggles to stay on the camera. The camera's too small for me. What's my preference? Well, my preference is for a larger body, if I'm being perfectly honest. And the competitor to this body is obviously the Canon R7. And the Canon R7 obviously just fits in my hand a little bit better. But I can see why this would be attractive to people who want a small body, because it, it's tiny and it weighs less than 500 grams. So if that's the sort of thing you're after, then this has it in spades. How do they make it so small? The obvious thing is the position of the viewfinder. It's all the way on the left hand side here as opposed to in the middle on most cameras so they can keep the profile down. The actual side profile, how do they make it so narrow? Well there's only one SD card which you know is a bit of a bummer, I'd prefer two but they've obviously made that design choice to keep the actual body nice and thin. Thankfully they've kept the standard Sony battery which comes in here which is great. Um, other differences that I immediately picked up on the back of the camera at least is there's no joystick. So I love having a joystick to move the spot autofocus around. It just makes it a bit easier for wildlife. So it's admitted that. In fairness it does have a nice big AF on button which I'm happy to see. I don't think the previous versions had that. Unfortunately there's no second back button like you see on the a7 IV or some of the Canon bodies. Instead they've got this very strange C1 button on the side of the camera here. I don't know who's who's got weird fingers to get around there, but when you're shooting, you've got to literally move your thumb around to hit this button and it's just odd. I don't know why they've done that. I would much prefer to have a button where it's traditionally are because it's just quicker for your thumb to go over. So bit of an oddity there, but that's the way it goes. One thing I do like is Sony obviously have their control dial D-pad, which I absolutely love. And the other thing I really like is they've got a brand new sub dial under the traditional dial. And this is how we switch from photo to video. The LCD screen itself is nice and big. And overall, it's got the features you would expect. It's actually got three dials, which is great. So we've got the dial here, dial on the back and a dial at the front. So one design feature that I struggle with on Sony a little bit is the position of their front control dial. Now this is minor, but because I changed my shutter speed on this dial, I'm changing it all the time. When I'm in the field and I'm hitting the shutter, to get my forefinger down, it's actually a bit awkward. <laughs> I don't know why it is, but it just is for me. Having used the Panasonic G9 II, which has the dial on the shutter button, I love that implementation. It's just so much easier for my finger just to go to it back to the shutter. The other thing that Sony doesn't seem to be implementing is function buttons on the front of the cameras. I, I quite like having buttons here that your fingers can touch. So I'm not sure why they have omitted those. Maybe in the future they'll give us some function buttons on the front of the camera. One thing I was apprehensive about was the size and placement of the EVF, but in reality I had no issues whatsoever. This EVF is 2.36 million dots resolution, so it's not as high as some of the other bodies, but it does have 120 FPS refresh rate, and I had no issue using it in the field. It looked quite good, and I, I was appreciative. They've got zebras in the viewfinder, which is great, and overall the actual experience in the field was fine. I had no issues whatsoever. So in terms of the sensor inside the camera, Sony have put in a backside illuminated 26 megapixel APS-C sensor. Bit of a mouthful. Uh, it's not quite as many megapixels as you'll get in the R7, which is 32, and I think the Fuji X-T5 even goes all the way up to 40. Okay, so what I'm really interested in is the readout speed of the sensor. If you remember, the readout speed dictates our rolling shutter, and it also influences the autofocus performance. So the faster the readout, the better the camera's gonna operate. So how do we test it? Well, I've taken a few shots of my drone just to see what sort of rolling shutter we get. And unfortunately, this camera did not perform very well at all. It was actually worse than the Canon R7, which has some rolling shutter. And it's probably on par with the R10, uh, maybe a little bit worse. So my guess is it's actually higher than 40 milliseconds, which means you will get some rolling shutter in electronic mode and it may impact the autofocus performance. So I would have preferred a faster readout, but that's the way it is. 
so that one of the consequences of such a slow readout is the maximum FPS. And the maximum FPS or frames per second on this body is 11 in both mechanical and electronic. So 11 is not slow. It used to be as fast as you could get. But in a lot of bodies now, we can get 20, 30, 40 FPS. And I sort of prefer 20 FPS now for my wildlife photography just to get those extra wing positions and capture that action. So I would have preferred a high FPS. And another feature this camera is lacking is any type of pre-capture in RAW. Obviously Panasonic, Olympus, Canon, they're all putting pre-capture in, which is really, really good for wildlife. So the all-important question is, well, what's the buffer like at 11 frames per second? Well, I believe you can get about 59 shots, which is close to six seconds, which is pretty good. And I didn't have any issues in the field. Now, the benefit of Sony over, say, Panasonic and Canon is it doesn't stop you taking photos when you hit the buffer. It just reduces the frame rate, which is a great implementation, and I really do appreciate Appreciate that. Alrighty, so we've chatted about the body. Now it's time to go out into the field and take some photos, which is what I think to be the most important. What sort of shots can we get from this camera? Well, I'm very fortunate, obviously, to have the Sony 200 to 600 and the Tamron 150 to 500 here to test. This lens here from Tamron, I've used it before, and I think it's actually extremely good value. I think it retails for around 1200 US, so it's a lot cheaper than the 2000 of the Sony. And at 500 millimeters, that gives us 750 millimeters field of view on the APS-C. And I just like this lens. It's quite sharp, wide open, and no issues. The only downside to this lens is it's actually quite heavy. I think it's about 1.8 kilos. So you're looking at about 2.3 kilos for this combo. So I decided to go out to a local lake to see what the performance was like. And I've used my monitor to capture the autofocus so we can see that in action. And the first thing I noticed was the autofocus implementation on this body is extremely good. So it found the subject, it stuck on the eye, and it reminded me of the A1 or some of the top level bodies. So it's great that Sony have put their advanced autofocus system in this body. And as you can see, it's actually tracked this black fronted dotterel extremely well. We were in low light, the sun hadn't even come up yet, and it's tracking it as this bird is moving around. I've taken a heap of shots in that session and I ultimately ended up with this shot, which I quite like. I like the out of focus grass at the front, which complements the top of the image and the detail is excellent given the high ISO and lack of light. Now, as the sun came up, we got some beautiful light hitting the water and I had an Australasian grebe swimming through the water and I just really love the colors in this. Again, the tracking worked perfectly on the eye. Unfortunately, when I looked at the raw files, I noticed that there was some distracting vegetation in the bottom half of the image and I would have much preferred a beautiful reflection. So if you're not aware, photo, the latest version of Photoshop now has a generative fill AI option, which will give you a reflection. So I decided to try it and here's the result. It's kind of unbelievable to be honest that Photoshop is that smart. I guess we need to talk about the ethics behind altering images like this. My opinion is if you are open and honest about what you've done to the image and you declare whether you've used AI, I don't mind using it and I'll continue to use it in the future. I then spotted a little pied cormorant on a rock and it was just very nice side lighting. So there was just light hitting the subject. The background was quite dark. I've underexposed it on purpose to just bring that subject, make it pop. And I'm quite happy with the shot. There's not a lot going on here, but I just thought the light created a sort of dynamic interest. So that was the shot. Again, the autofocus performed well, sticking to the subject. Now my session had almost come to an end and I was packing up when I noticed a noisy miner and a eucalypt nearby. So I've just pulled the camera up. I've engaged autofocus. I was in wide area autofocus and it's actually struggled to find the bird. It sort of went to a branch. Thankfully, you've got access to spot autofocus. So I've put it in spot, put it onto the subject and then it started tracking the subject, which was great. And we actually got this shot, which I'm very happy with, mainly because it's a nice environmental shot. It includes a little bit of habitat. The bird's nice and sharp. I like the colors overall. The image just worked. Now I did have an opportunity to try some bird in flight with the Tamron and the Sony and the actual autofocus in the camera worked very well. And you can see a couple of bird in flight shots that I captured here little black cormorant and we obviously got this white ibis as well. I quite like both flight shots and they came up pretty well. So the other benefit of the Tamron lens is it's a little bit wider than the Sony. So it's 150 millimeters. So the field of view is what, 225 millimeters, which isn't that wide. However, I did take a landscape from the front of my house. I get to see this beautiful sunrise every morning and I enjoyed the colors. I liked a bit of that habitat there and I just really liked how this image turned out. Overall, I was very happy with the performance of this combo. Now, of course, the main lens that people probably want to know about is this Sony 200 to 600, just because it's such a fantastic sharp lens. It's about 2000 American, so you're looking at about 3400 for this combo. 
How is it going to operate in the field? I'm pretty confident that it would perform well. So I whacked it on this body and we went out. And actually, I didn't actually film it. I just went out and had a bit of fun wandering around to my local patch. And of course, my favorite little antichinus popped up and we managed to get the shot of it on a log. I actually quite like the pose here. Funny enough, the, once the subject seen me, he's scooted behind a little branch and popped its head over and we managed to get this shot, which I thought was quite cute. And again, the autofocus performed well in that scenario. And then whilst I was photographing that, I spotted a dusky wood swallow out in the open with the sunlight on it. We've taken a shot and whilst it's a bit boring this photo, it's the out of focus background, the detail, just one of those typical shots that you can expect to get using this combo. So because we get 900 millimeters field of view, I did try and photograph a grapevine moth, which was feeding on a clistamen in my front yard. And I was very happy with the level of detail we we're able to obtain here. Again, we had nice light, which definitely helps. But so you can use this combo for sort of small butterflies and moths and spiders, etc., and it definitely works well. So another advantage of this lens is you can use a 1.4 converter, which will make it 840 millimeter focal length, times that by 1.5 and you get 1260 millimeter field of view, which is a lot of reach and definitely helpful for small birds and different things. What should I photograph with that much focal length? Well, I tried to photograph the moon, <laughs> it's pretty obvious, and I was shocked with the level of detail. I don't think I've ever seen so much detail in any of my moon shots. And the crater in this just looks amazing. I was very, very happy with this. I will admit when you have this much reach, you do start to run into issues with um, heat haze if the subject's way off and you're likely to get more soft shots because just any movement is exacerbated. So I probably wouldn't be using the 1.4 all that often, but it's definitely an option. If you're not aware, it's spring down here in Australia and many of our beautiful parrots nest in hollows and eucalypts and often you'll see parrots checking out these hollows to breed. And I just happened to see a yellow rosella on the side of a eucalypt, and it's when I've walked past, it's given me the eye. I've taken this photo, and I actually just like that inquisitive look. And obviously all that reach, I wasn't even that close. I was quite a way off, and I was happy with how that shot turned out. My obviously preference would be the Sony 200-600. I just prefer this lens. However, if you can't afford this, you won't be disappointed with this Tamron lens. It performs extremely well. And if we were to just do a comparison between these two lenses, I, I did that and you can see on the screen that the 600 just makes that subject bigger. And when we zoom into 100%, we can see that the Sony definitely has that advantage as you would expect for the price difference and the focal length. So the next important thing for wildlife photography is its low light performance or its ISO performance. How much noise are we gonna get in our images? I took some test shots at ISO 12,800. The first comparison that I wanted to make was with the Sony A7 Mark IV, which is a full frame body. So this is 26 megapixels APS-C, this is 33 megapixels full frame. So obviously the full frame is gonna have an advantage if we have the same field of view. So that's what I tried first. Full frame body obviously outperforms the APS-C. It has a lot less noise, way more detail, and you would expect that being a full frame body. However, that's probably not a real fair comparison because often we can't get close to the subject and the APS-C is gonna make the subject bigger. So we need to do a test on the same lens. That's what I did. I've used the Sony 200 to 600 on both cameras. And to make the a7 IV the same field of view, I had to put this into crop mode. So that's what I did. I put it into the crop mode, which gives us a 14 megapixel file compared to the 26 megapixels. Okay, so when we zoom into 100%, we can see the clear advantage of APS-C. The subject is just much, much bigger, being 26 megapixels over 14, and it, the noise is very similar. So in terms of sharpness, it's fairly close, but I actually think the a7 IV has a slight advantage here. So in my opinion, in terms of low light, I would always go with the full frame body and just work on getting close to the subject. However, obviously, if you can't afford a full frame, the APS-C gives you that extra reach. Now, another good comparison we need to make is obviously switch out the A7 IV for the Canon R7. So the Canon R7 is obviously also APS-C. This is 32 megapixels, and this is obviously 26. So I've actually put 500 millimeter lenses on both, the Canon RF 100-500 on the Canon and the Tamron 150-500 on the Sony. And as you can see, our field of view is very, very similar. However, when we zoom into 100%, the Canon actually has an advantage because we've got more megapixels. And when I look, when I compare the two files, I actually think the Canon has less noise at 12,800 than the Sony does. When we go down to ISO 800, they're actually very, very similar but I think I'd give a slight advantage to the Canon R7 in terms of noise performance and size of the subject. 
Now we need to talk about the autofocus, which is obviously extremely important for wildlife photography. And this body does feature Sony's brand new autofocus with eye tracking for birds. So it's wonderful that we have that. It has 759 phase detection autofocus points. And Sony say that they have a dedicated processing chip specifically designed for deep learning subject detection capabilities. <laughs> it sounds very impressive. And in all honesty, in the field, the actual autofocus through the viewfinder was pretty good. It tracked subjects, bird and flight, it was excellent. It still got confused like a lot of mirrorless bodies do with backgrounds and branches. And I tried to photograph a yellow tufted honey eater on a callistamine. And as you can see, it's locked onto the background and not the bird, which meant I missed those shots. However, using spot autofocus, I was able to get it back onto the subject and we did get this shot, which has plenty of detail. I'm very happy. So it's not perfect, but it is very, very good. And I want to be completely honest about the autofocus. I had a session at the wetlands doing Doing bird and flight and as I was doing it I thought the autofocus was exceptional it was tracking the subjects however when I got back to the computer and I started reviewing the files I became somewhat disappointed because the results weren't matching my experience in the field so the EVF autofocus is very good however I got way less keepers than I expected my only thought could be its user error likely <laughs> or perhaps the readout speed of this body is just interfering with the autofocus capabilities. Again, I want to be crystal clear that I still got lots of good shots. It's just I got a lot of soft shots that I wasn't expecting. If you've got this body or you've used this body, maybe in the comments just let me know what your settings are and how you're finding it and whether you've had these same issues that I've encountered. Okay, so let's chat about some alternatives. If you're in the market for a wildlife camera that has eye tracking and it's around 1500 US or less, there's a couple of options. Obviously, this one, the A6700. I think Fuji has an XS20, which I've never used. And obviously, we have the Canon R7. Um, these are all pretty good bodies. They all feature eye tracking, and they all have pros and cons. But I obviously own the R7, so I can do a comparison between these two bodies. If we start with the Canon, I quite like the layout of this body. It feels good in my hand. It gives us up to 30 frames per second. It's got dual SD cards. It's got pre-capture, the autofocus is pretty good. And overall, I just quite like this body for its price. And it does Sony on the other hand, obviously a much smaller form factor if you want a smaller body. Uh, the video is obviously extremely good, but it's missing a lot of those features that I just mentioned. And for me, for that reason, I prefer the Canon body if I had to choose between the bodies. However, one massive advantage of the Sony is the available lenses that you can get for this body. You've obviously got these two here, which are great. The 200 to 600, the 150 to 500, but you also can pick up the Sigma 60 to 600, the Sony 100 to 400, the Sony 70 to 350, and I think there's even a couple of uh, third party 100 to 400s. So for Canon, we have the 100 to 500 and the 100 to 400 in terms of zoom lenses. You can get the 800 to f11 as well, but I think zoom lenses just offer more versatility. And unfortunately on Canon, this lens here is very expensive. If we're looking at a R7 100 to 500 combo, I think in the US this retails for around 4,400, but I think it's on sale at the moment for 4,000. In comparison, we can pick up the Sony and this lens here for around 3,300. So this Sony kit is a lot more affordable. And if we go into the Australian market or overseas markets, often Canon is very expensive. And unbelievably, in Australia, you can get this Sony 200-600 and the A6700 for the exact same price as this lens. So this lens is 4,400 Australian dollars. You can pick out this combo for that exact amount. So in terms of value, the Sony just absolutely shines and I think is obviously a much better option if money or value is what you're after. If you can afford the 100 to 500, I was curious to see what the files would look like between the Sony 200 to 600 and the 100 to 500. So that's exactly what I did. I took a couple of test shots. When we look at the images straight out of camera, obviously the Sony has a narrower field of view, making that subject slightly bigger. But when we zoom into 100%, the details get very interesting. The Canon subject is actually bigger. <laughs> Why is that? Well, we've got 32 megapixels versus 26. And if you're not aware, the Sony isn't a true 600 millimeter lens when we get close to the subject. It loses focal length. It's probably closer to 550 or 560 or something like that. So in terms of actual subject size, the Canon is superior, which is probably a shock to a lot of people and was a bit of a shock to me. So if you can afford it, Perhaps this combo here is slightly better for wildlife than this combo, but if you want to save a few dollars, there's nothing wrong with the Sony kit. 
at the end of the day, and I've said this numerous times, it doesn't matter what gear you have, the important thing is just getting out to the field and using it. Any of this gear is capable of taking really good shots. So just go with what appeals to you. Is it weight, is it size, your budget? Just get what you can afford and enjoy the kit that you've got and just get out there and enjoy yourself. That's the key. So in terms of the video performance, I suggest you go and watch some other reviews. I'm not a videographer. Uh, I know it has 4K 120, even though it's a massive crop, and Sony is well known for their video features. The IBIS is actually very good. It's reported to be very high, but again, maybe just watch a few of those other reviews. In conclusion, I've been pretty impressed with the package that Sony have delivered. To have a body this small with the advanced autofocus, great image quality, three dials, Overall, it's been a very good experience. If you're after a budget camera and this small form factor that gives you that 1.5 crop and you have access to these amazing wildlife lenses, then this may be the body for you. However, if you want a camera with dedicated wildlife features, I think there are better options out there. The Canon R7, for example, is a good one. But if you want to stick with Sony, I really like the A7 Mark IV. Of course, it's more expensive, but I've been very impressed with the performance of the A7 IV. The files are fantastic. It's nice and sharp, and I've really enjoyed the autofocus and the performance of this body. So one critique of myself is I didn't actually use this camera enough, to be honest. I would have liked to have used it more. So if you own this camera, maybe jump down to the comments and write your own mini review. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. What can be improved? Did I get anything wrong? Do you agree with anything I've said? People often want to hear from owners of the camera. They're the ones with the best experience. So I highly suggest jumping down in the comments section and checking out what people have said about this body. Overall, I had a lot of fun. I enjoyed taking the photo. So a big thank you to Sony, a big thank you to Tamron. If you enjoyed this review, obviously give it that thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more of these videos. And of course, thank you to all my beautiful members that have joined the channel. Um, if you're not aware for the price of less than a cup of coffee, you directly support me you get access to the calendar this year and I'll be doing a new one soon so thank you very much to all of those members until the next video take care happy birding and see you later